nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. All right, so we'll get started today. And uh, uh, this is only the second week of classes. Generally, most of the time, uh, the second week of class, we are just getting started for the the semester long class, but this is a five week class, so that means that we are already almost uh, will be done with forty percent of the lectures this week, so which is which is pretty fast. All right. So today my goal is uh, to begin a discussion about model selection and goodness of fit. Uh, you know, uh, the first week. I started by talking about large and small data, right? big data, small data. And, uh, and then we, in the beginning, we started uh, with a discussion about how to analyze the input data without really making any assumptions. Uh, so for example, how to throw away the outlier, how to do the various histograms, which is unbiased, that you don't choose the intervals but you have a way either by stem and lift diagram or with a functional form that gives you the optimum. We talked about median, how to draw lines, how to draw distribution function, all without ever really thinking about that, whether it's a normal distributed or variable or this and that distributed. No physics, and up to that point, no physics, just the data itself. And I think this is a sort of an often a missed opportunity that people often, as soon as they have their data, they want to throw a straight line, then they want to fit something. I think it's very important, especially in the big data regime, uh, not, to, not to jump to conclusions too early, treat your data with respect. Uh, that is the first thing I said. Now, just uh, so that you don't get lost in the big picture of things, I just want to remind you uh, about the whole course. Uh, you may remember that collecting and plotting data is all about thinking about the inputs. X1, X2, do you want to throw away the X2? What is the median? If F1 of the X5 is uh, away from where it's supposed to be, your entire statistic should not change dramatically. In the last class, we began to talk about distributions. This uh, f, uh, small f is the probability distribution, large f is the cumulative probability distribution. Now in here, both you can come both from both sides. From the data, you can do discrete. Has in formula for the cumulative distribution function, uh, this Kaplan for formula for distribution function with when some of the data are not uh, valid data, right? So it's, the experiment has stopped for some time. So you can come from that side, or you can also come from the analytical side that let's say you know the normal distribution or variable distribution, then you can calculate a bunch of things, CDF or probability distribution function, hazard rates, you can calculate. Now, of course, our goal is to sort of match the two. If we have a bunch of data, we'll always, in the end of the day, we'll have some hypothesis. Let's say we are flipping coins, and we want to know whether the coin is fair or not. And then we'd like to uh, match with a uh, normal probability distribution to see whether uh, the coin originally was sort of uh, biased or not. Uh, simil similarly, if it's a get dielectric breakdown, we'd like to check whether it's variable distributed or not. So often, we'll have data and we'll have theory and we'd like to match them. And when do you know that match is good? Is sort of the discussion today. And what you'll see at the end of the lecture is actually the, these days the softwares are so powerful, all you have to do is to six, seven lines of code. And that six, seven lines will tell you a whole lot about whether you are heading in the right direction or you are making a mistake uh, and that you need to be careful about. It can save you months, if not years of effort of going in the wrong direction. So that in that way, the lecture is important. So let me, let me uh, get started with a, with a quick review of uh, what we were talking about in the last class. You may remember that in the last class we had 60 gate dielectric and we stressed it and uh, we saw seven of them failing within the first thousand hours. Thousand hours is about uh, how many days? Uh, it's, it's 24 hours. So let's say 16, 17 days, something like that. 
So it's already a long time uh, because uh, you want to sell a, get a product to the market in relatively, uh, relatively, uh, no, no. Uh, how many days? 40 days. Huh? 40 days. 40 days. So you can see a month is gone and yeah, the Christmas may be coming soon. And so your product has to be uh, in the shelf by Christmas. Otherwise, your company just uh, went bankrupt. And so therefore, one month is already a long time and you have to predict for years to come whether the thing will be reliable. So let's say we had some measured data shown here in the red and then last class I showed you that if you have a log normal distribution, you'll have some moments, you know, average standard deviation. If you have a variable distribution, you'll have some average and uh, you'll have some uh, standard deviation and you can match them very easy. And then you can see that uh, both of them fit sort of well. And if you didn't do the other one, you'll be very happy because then you have only one and that fits very well. But what I told you that that's a very dangerous thing to do. What you just did was to fit a, you have seven samples or 10 samples. It fitted very well for that. But your product may have a billion transistors in your cell phone, a billion. And you may be saying, you may be selling a million of those phones. And so you just from seven, you are trying to extrapolate to 10 to the power 15, 10 to the power 16. Uh, so humongous number. And in, when you do that, uh, you want to know first few failures was when they are going to show up and you can be completely wrong. So how can you do better is what I want to do. I want to do discuss today. The first thing to do better is to remember how we fit lines. Although, you know, when often when you think about uh, straight lines, um, uh, there we don't think much about it because we start doing it when we are very young and before we had a lot of th uh, things to think about. And uh, generally we know how to do it. If you have a set of blue points, Y and X, uh, in that case, uh, let's say if you have a variable distribution, let's say so W is like Y, log of T is like X. So we plot it in various ways, X, Y, and we generally uh, fit a straight line. And the approach to fitting the straight line is relatively simple. What we try to do, we try to find a line that sort of goes, uh, goes through them and makes everyone sort of happy. Uh, that uh, you you give some, you take away some, and you do it square so that, uh, that that so the difference is always a positive number, and you try to balance this line uh, so that uh, it sort of minimizes the error between the line predicted line and the error between uh, and and the actual data. That's what we generally what we learn to do. And uh, if you may spend a few minutes in sort of between this and that, you can uh, calculate the error. You can ex put it in here and then you can get the coefficients A, B and the determinant D of some sort. And then essentially you can uh, do the formula. This is no, no problem, right? You just put it in uh, and try to minimize, minimize the error and you, we, you get this. These days you don't even have to do that. You put it in Excel, it draws you a straight line, even if and before you can even ask it to. So that's very good. But this is sort of uh, a very interesting thing because first of all, it's not just focusing on the moments, it is treating all data with some respect because even the data may be sitting somewhere uh, uh, on the corner. Uh, it, remember the moments generally focuses on things that happen in the middle the median or the interquartile range, it, whatever happens in the middle, moments focus them on, on more of them. But at least, at the very least, this is better because this is at least looking at the ones that are in the end. But this is also a little bit dangerous because if one of the lines accidentally moves away, uh, then the line will be completely trying to follow that. So that in that sense, it is a little, little dangerous. And that's why I'll be, uh, when we do machine learning, you'll see we'll be using uh, a function called sigmoid functions and other things. It is just to save us from the tyranny of straight lines because the straight line often is very fickle. It moves left and right with just a few points around it. But we'll come to that. For now, let's focus on this one. This is what you, we know we, we all do. Now, where did that thing come from? 
and you will often see when you are doing a uh, derivation of this that you will see that n minus 2 uh, is sitting in the variance formula. Now by now you know that um, that this anytime you see n is the number of samples in the, in the previous case how many samples you had four points there are four point n is four y minus two well anytime you have a x plus b so you have how many unknown coefficients of a and b so therefore anytime you are fitting a formula where you have trying to determine two quantities a and b then you have to take away it's like taking away two moments if you are doing a third order of some sort, then you will be uh, taking away n minus 3. So, the, therefore, anytime you do a higher order fit, you actually have to, your standard deviation begins to broaden because you have to divide it by that. Now, there is a, a very important uh, point about drawing the straight line, which is the assumption is that the error that you make from the straight line that you draw versus the actual line, these are Gaussian distributed. Gaussian meaning that the error, some of them would be a little bit from the mean, mean meaning you subtract this and certain some, some of those, but the points that would be far from here would be very few. In a Gaussian distribution, you know, points far from the average is very few, so the same thing. Now, where did that come from? That's also another strange thing that uh, the, this is something we do, but we probably never think about, uh, ne never think about it. Actually, it turns out that there is a very deep theory behind it. And this, uh, this regression or this straight line drawing is something, is a special case of something called maximum likelihood estimator. And that is really the real thing and this is a special case and this special case often does not hold. So, you have to be, so the, uh, for next time you plot something, uh, you have to be a little careful. Uh, by the way, so there is a, in the, in the Excel, there is a linest function, uh, this is an array function in which uh, you can just uh, uh, in the, choose the column which is supposed to be x, uh, supposed to be y, choose another column that is supposed to be x and if you want it to have a constant then you have to have c and all the statistics which is the a and the, var the error rates and all, all those things will come out in one second. So, uh, in the homework you will see I will ask, I have already posted the homework. So, if you practice it you will see how, uh, how this is this sort of works out. Now, you can, of course, uh, you can, you don't have to do it uh, only for a normal straight line, you can do it for anything. Uh, the whole point is that you can choose any theory and this one uh, could be the theory associated with, uh, uh, it could be Weibull, it could be power law, it could be fish in the river problem depending on the, on the problem that you have and this is your data in experiment and the, the main point about least square method is that you minimize the error. And the way you get the error, write the equations, you, you write the error and take a derivative with respect to the first coefficient. And if you take the error and with respect to the second coefficient, that gives you two equations, two equations, two unknowns, that gives you the, the uh, coefficients a and b that fit best, fits the line. Now, of course, uh, uh, why is it two? There is no reason. If it is a Poisson distribution which has only one unknown coefficient, in that case you just take one derivative. If it is a Pearson function that has three unknowns, well you take three derivatives and then set it to zero, then you get three. Uh, so therefore, you just, all you have to do is to just write the equations and then that gives you the, the corresponding uh, best fit parameters and then that gives you the, the data. Now, one thing uh, is very important that this notion of uh, if the distribution, let's say this is y is equal to b x plus c, let's say. So, uh, ln t is like an x, let's say you, you are do doing that. One thing is very important, if your fit of the line is good, then if you flip the x and y axis, if you flip the x and y axis and refit the data then it should still be good. 
if you know that now it, you have, because you have just inverted it. On the other hand, if it is not good, in that case, uh, you will be in trouble because both lines will not fit very well. So this is the first thing that people generally take, and generally, and so you can you can calculate the coefficients now. now if you flip it now, x is equal to a star y plus b. So you just flipped it, the original equation, and fitted it again. And if you do that, once you this inverse fitting, you do that, then what you can do, the error that you will come, the original error and the new error, together is called R square. And often you will see that they say R square error. What they just did was to sort of flip the equation and then looked at the error one more time in the flipped axis and see whether it's still good. If it is still good, that means the errors are nicely balanced and there's Gaussianly distributed. I mean, in both sides, the errors are Gaussian distributed. Now, it is very important because often in a small data set, you'll be thinking about what value of R, remember this R, what value of correlation coefficient uh, is good enough, good enough. Then it turns out that there is a probability table. And the, the way to read the probability table, and again, you'll be doing a homework that you'll understand. Let's say, in the previous examples, how many data points do you have? We had four data points, right? Four circles, do you remember? Straight, straight line I had? I had four, so I would take four. And let's say the correlation coefficients after fitting the four data, after fitting the straight line, was 0.9. Because I can just go depending on the result that has come after fitting. Let's say it's 0.9. That says that there is only 0.1 or 10% chance of accidental fitting. That the line is actually not good. It is not really a straight line. It wants to be some other line. But the probability that it is an erroneous straight line, that it's not really a straight, it, the data really wants you to bend. But you have fitted it with a straight line. The probability is less than 10%. Similarly, let's say if you have 10 data points, now more data points you have, more stringent it becomes, and your correlation is 0.9 or more. In that case, there is almost no chance that if you have 20 data points, still correlation is 0.9, almost no chance that the data is accidentally a straight line. It is really in that case zeroth order and straight line. So these are the things that you want to check. Many of the softwares automatically these days, for put this number. You have to just read it uh, because often some people keep taking experimental data, keep going to the lab and making measurements. Well, if you already know to a point that theory has been satisfied to the zeroth order, taking more does not really give you more accuracy because you are sort of done with that experiment. And taking more is you are just sort of wasting your time. So it's in that sense, statistics is helpful. All right. But this is not why I started this, cl uh, this class, because I wanted to tell you straight line is good, but the straight line, the fitting that we do is really a special case of this maximum likelihood method uh, or make maximum likelihood estimated. Uh, this was a method proposed by Fisher. Fisher is the Einstein of uh, statistics. So if you Anything that we do in modern statistics, he, uh, and he was not even in university. I'm not sure, probably he didn't even have a PhD, but he had the knighthood and everything, and uh, he is the, the big guy uh, in, in the field. So how does he say that you should fit a line? And that's what I'm going to, going to tell you. Assume that you have a bunch of data points, and let's say, uh, these are five gate dielectric breakdowns, so BD stands for breakdown time. I come from reliability breakdown, so I give these examples, but you realize that it can be any ordered data that you have collected, height of a few people. You can have a, uh, you know, uh, five foot five, five foot seven, five foot nine, and whatever, you can have some data. So this data uh, is given. I want to know which distribution this data is best represented by. Is it a variable distribution? Is it a normal distribution? Which distribution is this? Where was the original thing came from? So he says, uh, Fisher says, that do the following. Assume a distribution. This is F, 
is that it could be weighable. If you if you want to start with weighable, good. Go ahead, start weighable. Ti at these values, these these values, hundred seconds, three hundred twenty-five seconds, and so on and so forth. Let's say, and alpha beta are your unknown coefficients. You still don't know what alpha beta are because that's what you're trying to determine. Remember the straight line we want to also get a and b. So that's what we are trying to do. So the, he says the first thing you have to do, assume some alpha beta. Assume some alpha beta. So I'm calling that alpha beta, alpha 1, beta 1. Assume anything that your heart desires, you assume it. Now, of course, because it's a distribution function, if alpha beta is known and if you put ti in there, it will give you a value. Just like a Gaussian distribution. If you choose that this is 3 sigma away from the distribution and if you knew the shape, you can immediately calculate the height of that distribution, right? And similarly, you can get the height of the second one, you can get the height of the third, fourth, fifth one. Next comes this interesting part. He says, multiply this, all these numbers. Multiply all these numbers. Multiply all these numbers and whatever you get from that multiplication with that alpha 1 and beta 1, call that L1 and for a L versus alpha beta plot, put a number over there. This is the rate point. Whatever you got out of the product, you got, got this number. Y product is with something will come in a second. But more importantly, in machine learning, they use a slightly different form because they are also using Fisher's maximum likelihood. It is just that they don't know because when they write it, they think that they have discovered something new, but I will going to show you that they are using a variant of Fisher's formula, but we will come to that. Now, let's say, who knows that this alpha, alpha 1, beta 1 is good. You say, okay, I'll do alpha 2, beta 2. You know, in a computer, you just do a bunch of alpha 1, alpha 2, and beta 1, beta 2, and then do them. So, you do another one. Now, of course, the distribution has changed now because my alpha, beta are different. And it is like having the different straight line. You're probing that what straight line gives me the correct answer. And obviously, in that case, what's going to happen, I'm sorry, that now your height would be this one for the blue curve, this multiplied by that, multiplied by that, multiplied by that, and multiplied by that. So that you will, in some cases, you'll be bigger, and in some cases, it will be smaller. And from that product, you will get another blue point for L2, which is the blue point here. And then you do a few more. You do a thousand more, let's say. And that's at the end, what's going to happen, at some point, this function L will be maximized. And hence, it's the maximum likelihood. And it turns out that that indeed is the value which will make the distribution, make the fit perfect. There are two questions. Weibull may not be the right distribution to begin with. So therefore, simply because Weibull fitted the best does not mean that Weibull is the one. But if it is Weibull, then that alpha beta is the best alpha beta. Then you can do with normal, then another alpha beta, two, whatever one. If you have 10 of them, you do 10 of them. And all of them are one line in MATLAB code. Just put the data in, it will immediately returns you that. Now, often this product we don't like, so therefore we take a log on both sides, and as you know, that log product becomes a sum, and then sum of logs, right? So product will become a, a, a sum of logs, and then what you want to do, minimize this one with respect to alpha, with respect to beta, so therefore you don't have to do a thousand numerical experiment. You can directly get to the peak point directly because by which by taking these partial derivatives that is also going to give you these two equations and then you'll be set. It's clear, right? That this is what the maximum likelihood is. Yes. So uh, could you define this function f? Because it looks like you're just putting in the x values of your or the t values of your data. But where do the like what is the function f? Where do the corresponding like let me give you one example. I have two, three examples and the example will clarify this. For a function f is a distribution function. Mm -hmm. So it could be a normal uh, function 
Uh, let me give you one more. Let me work out one example, and then then I will ask you again. Well, it's a distribution function. I just wanted to know, like, where does your measured data come into this? Is, are you subtracting the different? No, values? no, no. You are just putting the measured data. Let, let's let's do this one, and then after the, after the exam uh, example, I will. Uh, let me skip this one. Let me. Uh, I will. I will come back to this one. Let's let's try this one. I want to give you an example that will clarify this concept. Let's say your distribution function. You believe that what the problem that you are working with is best described by a Poisson distribution, single parameter Poisson distribution. So you don't have alpha and beta. You have a single parameter which is k. Right? And what is your function? Your function is k t to the power k t square over 2. This is your function f. At this point, you don't have any data or anything. This is a function. If you like, you can discover any, any of your own functions, like a, a, you could say uh, sine k t yeah. could be another function, let's for example. So choose a function. So in this case, let's say, choose, let me choose this one. Then this is what I do. Let's take a look at uh, uh, this value. Did you see what I did? Let's say the first data point is t1. And so I evaluated this function at t1. And t1 could be 310 seconds. So I put 310 seconds here. I put 310 seconds here. So the t1, I put the two t1s there. Similarly, this is for the first t1. Then I have second t, t2, so I put t2 there, t3, t4. So if I have five data points, I will create a product of five. If I have 25 data points, then there will be a product of 25. Is it clear? Hmm? F is the probability distribution. Of course, of course, F is the probability. It is the candidate probability distribution that you are thinking that maybe this is this will describe the physics. You don't know. You're trying to get to that value. Uh, the y values of the experiment? Pardon me? Where are the y values of the experiment? There's no y value because you are only measuring time when things are breaking. Okay. When they are failing. So okay. there's no y. You are trying to see what y cumulative probability could it be? And the alpha beta, once you have alpha beta, then you know the f value, the probability value. Let me go back very quickly, just uh, uh, to remind you that the f when I first saw this, I thought this is beautiful for the following reason. This is for the first time I, I understood that straight line is really a special case of maximum likelihood in the following way. Let us say that the error when you are drawing a straight line, the error is a Gaussian distributed error. You see, do you remember Gaussian distribution? This is the sigma and this is the y minus yi, right? This is that and then that sigma squared. So this is a Gaussian distribution. So if you have a Gaussian distribution, then we know how, how to do it. We will take the, we'll construct this L function as a product of all this and we are going to evaluate it at yi, at different yi. And these are given, right? Yi is given, Xi is also given because we are doing a straight line. And if you then take a log, you know, this is just a few lines of math that when you take a product of a bunch of exponential, the product essentially becomes a sum on the top of the exponential. And so you do that. And then what happens that if you take a log and take a derivative with respect to A, remember I'm trying to do a straight line. So it, uh, I have to take a derivative with respect to A and another derivative with respect to B. So if I take a derivative, what you will be finding is exactly this equation which came from fitting the straight line in Excel. So it turns out the error probability, that's when we knew that the error probability of a fitting of straight line, the way we do, actually has underneath it an assumption that the distribution is distributed Gaussian, right? That's, that's, that's the distribution. Generally, we don't know about that. We just look at the distance. We don't think about how the errors are distributed. So this example I just worked out. 
Uh, can you think about what would be, uh, I have to give you a quick uh, um, exercise. Just think about for one second that if you take a log of L, then the first term you can see the first term is k ln k, uh, n ln k. That's no problem, right? Second one will be a product of all this. It will be a product of all this. And then third one will be a product of all this, right? So therefore, the second term is this. When you take a log, then it becomes a sum of this. What is the third term of the three? Which one do you, would you choose? Just for a 10 second uh, break for you. Okay, you cannot see, right? Ooh, so no, the right answer may be already there. <laughs> Which one do you think is the correct answer? B and C. Yeah, B hmm? and C is yes. the same thing, right? Oh, B and C is the same thing. I'm sorry. I'm supposed to, you're right. I'm supposed to take away the T, T squared. I'm sorry. This is, <laughs> all right. But you get the idea, right? B and C? All right. So I agree that it is B and C. All right. So if it is a B and C, then uh, you, you are right and then what you can do is uh, take a derivative with respect to what? Not, uh, there is no alpha beta here. Unknown coefficient is k. k. So take a one derivative. So there is one k here, no k here, another k here. So that's it. This is the value of k. 2n, whatever number of samples you have, if you had five samples, that is 10. And whatever is the TI value, you know, 310 uh, second, 525 seconds, whatever was the value, you sum them up, you have to do it by square, and that will give you the value of K. We did not fit a straight line here. The assumption of Gaussian error is not in here. This is the best distribution that you could possibly have, right? Clear, right? Okay. Now, if you wanted to do two parameters uh, and then wanted to fit it, uh, you should say no problem at all. Let's say this is a probability distribution. You looked it up. You don't know. Data may be uh, fitted by this distribution, two parameters, beta and alpha. So, per two parameters, again, uh, take a product of all this, just like what we did before. Evaluated at T1, T2, T3, T4, and so on and so forth. Take a product and take a log. And if you do that, I have already done it for you. It will come like a, all these four terms. So what have to, what do you have to do after that? After that, you have to take a derivative with respect to alpha and with respect to beta. These two things you have to take a derivative. And if you take a derivative, then after you have done, you will get this very bad looking equations. Now, it turns out that why is it bad looking? Because it's not like you can throw it in Excel and can get it. Although you can throw it in MATLAB and you can get it. Do you see why this is a, people generally don't want it, didn't want to do it before computers? The reason is, you see, the value of alpha depends on the value of beta. So, it's an intrinsic equation. Yes, you have two equations, two unknowns, but you have to solve them simultaneously. How do you solve them simultaneously? You assume some beta. Let's say beta is 1. Then you get an alpha. You throw that thing alpha in here and you get a beta. And you throw that beta in here and maybe do two times. You don't have to do anything these days. The computer does it for you. If you just MLE and then put it in a bracket, in two seconds it will do all this and just give it at your feet that this is your alpha and beta value. But you can see that uh, this is not sort of uh, something very simple in the days before. We are talking about 1920s, 30s. There's computers still don't exist. So people, you can see that people will not be very happy. Students in particular will not be very happy uh, to calculate all these numbers by hand. But the point is that you can do it for any distribution. Doesn't matter whether it's two parameter, five parameter, whatever. You can do that, right? You get the idea. So now, you have learned something which is very important, maximum likelihood estimator. This is how one fits data. Now, let's say you have fit the data. How do you know the data is any good? Because still you don't have any physics. 
often in my my work what i do uh, do is that often people say that you have to have a hypothesis and then you have to go to the lab and then do testing and all that's not how it actually works this is called a top down research hypothesis then you design experiment often it goes the other way you do it two ways student brings in a bunch of data and i look at the data and i have a lot of experience so i know what it could be then you play with the data a little bit fit a few things and the data will gradually trying to tell you a story and then you go back and try to the what theory you try to tell you the story right it goes back and forth it never science is not likely so this is how it actually works uh, if your advisor says otherwise he is not telling the truth uh, so six six tests and again six lines in matlab and it's all done and therefore uh, these are uh, first thing is your eye is a very powerful machine our eyes generally recognize pattern long before and anything else does so you must always plot the data just like i previously i plotted it as a normal plot i make the x axis log so that i could look at the tail so first thing is plot the data and check visually there's no substitute no math no physics for this first check the data and see whether it's a good fit or not because if this data points is sort of moving all over the place then both f1 and f2 are wrong but in this particular case it looks like both of them are sort of so at least zero order is okay second thing you do is look at the residual of the data residual of the data is whatever the fitting is then you subtract the fitted fit if you have a straight line look at the data and subtract it if your data is good if your data is good uh if your fit is good then the residual will be randomly placed across the line more or less randomly placed across the line at this point you may find that some of your residuals are too high and in that case you don't know whether this one is corrupting the data this might have somehow gotten through your what was the Uh, the outlier test do you remember that outlier test generally if you have thrown away the outlier test this should not be there but let's say somehow it has gotten in then what you have to do is to throw away this data and then fit again because it is obviously significantly away from your region of interest because even one data line in this case can significantly push the whole thing up or down so that's something you don't want but if you see that the data is having this pattern where this is going systematically up and down you know your fit is not good the physics is not good because what is supposed to be left behind is noise your physics is supposed to catch that line and if you are if you see a pattern like this that means you still have left behind some physics in your function that's something very important so therefore you should take a look look at this and again ulfam alpha and all will immediately plot all this if you scroll down in the bottom of the page you will see they do all these things immediately third one is a fourth or we will call it a qq method and i want to quickly tell you how this one works uh tell me uh, you know you are now experts in this let's say what is the quartile point for for this how many points do i have here 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 10 huh? okay 10 so well, what will be the what is the median point first of all tell me what is the median oh so therefore i i should have put 9 i did not put 9 there it should be 9 but uh, what is the first quartile point 7 7 so i certainly this should be 9 and then what is the third quartile point do you see that 15, 15. so i have three points right i have 7 9 and 15 so these would be will eventually form my y axis in a second now let's say you you think that this data is described by a exponential distribution remember that k that we had been talking about a few minutes ago so let's say you have done mle you have got in the k and you have that k and so what will happen that if this is really a uh, exponential distribution then the first quartile would be p is what for first quartile probability is 
one fourth. So one fourth, it would be one fourth will be three fourth with a minus sign up front, it will be four over three, 1.33. So log 1.33 divided by k. Why did I get the formula? You can just integrate that exponential distribution to know when this 25 percent, 30 percent, uh, 50 percent, 75 percent and all. Okay. So, uh, yeah, what will be the second quartile point? Second content point will be this because probability will be half. And so, this will become your x axis. So, you have three points there and you have three points there. x axis is telling you, you know, what your theory says in 25 percent, 50 percent, 75 percent where the data should be. Y axis is telling you where the data actually is. And e only if it's a straight line, that's through the QQ, quartile, quartile. Then it says the distribution is good. So, for example, and uh, I, I'll just explain in a second. So, therefore, let's say you have seven, you said, right? Seven, uh, another was nine, 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 and another is 15. So, these are the three points. And over there, the first quartile point, second quartile point, and third quartile point from the fitted data, from the fitted function with the k value. And only if this is a straight line, then you know the fit is good. And again, you will be doing his uh, homework and you will see that. Now, it doesn't have to be this quartile. So, the thing is really this is called Q quantile. Quantile means that equal division. So, if you want to divide by 10 groups, fine. 10 groups, if you want to divide, then you will call it a decile, right? So, the idea is that you see, if your distribution is really that good, then it should be good group by group. It is not good only in summation with a square mean error, but it should be good group by group. And that's what this is, is checks and very powerful, uh, powerful uh, things uh, in terms of QQ plot, widely used. So, I have given one example, um, and here I indeed have nine, so therefore don't hold me against it. Uh, but you get the idea. And in a recent paper, not a recent, a couple of years ago, um, I did some uh, work with a student and uh, there's people were asking questions that whether something was really log normally distributed or not. And the QQ plot showed that indeed for amorphous silicon transistor and organic solar cell transistors, it was more or less straight line, but definitely for six and for cadmium telluride, the physics is not, that assumption of that distribution was not correct. So, this is in. Go ahead. It should be 40 degrees. So it should be one, right? Not it should be, a, a, yeah, it should be 45 in that sense, but sometimes it's not scaled. If the data is scaled, then it should be 45. But it would be a straight line because the y and x axis may not be, have the same scale. Yeah, if you do quartile properly, divide by the n, or n plus 1, and do it as a percentage, then you are right that it should be, it should be 45 degrees. You get the idea, right? All right. Fourth test. Uh, this is called a Coxworks text. And again, the, this one is a humongous amount of work. And people in statistics fight about this type of thing, right? So they will take the third, uh, third, um, um, third moment and normalize it. This is the, of course, the mean. This is the standard deviation. You know all those, but you see, um, uh, n minus 1 you also uh, know because mu is already taken out, so therefore it becomes n minus 1. Um, so, but the thing is that these points, uh, you have, what you have to plot is mu 3 star, which is in the y axis you put this number, and in x axis you put sigma over mu, this sigma and this mu. And it turns out that every distribution, Weibull, like Weibull has a certain relationship between mu3 and gamma. Log normal has a distribution. Uh, your um, gamma function uh, may have a distribution. So, every distribution has a form and you can then plot your data's, uh, data's uh, mu3 star, then you can get the uh, mu and then sigma from your data and then put it in here. Whichever distribution it is close to, that will be the distribution that uh, would be the most relevant. For example, in this particular case, the Weibull distribution 
is sort of the base. But here you cannot say. For this value, it could either be log normal or it could be the gamma function, but you cannot say ahead of uh, ahead of time. Right? Fifth one, lot of lot of tests, very quick tests. But the fifth one says it doesn't matter how you did on average. You know, you can get an A in various uh, B in a class in various ways. You can get a uh, lot of A's and a few C's. You can get a B. But the, if what this one says that it doesn't matter how good it is, we will always look at the place where you did the worst. That will tell me whether you are good enough or not. Right? That's a, that's a very bad uh, measure. But this is again, uh, this is a, called a case test in MATLAB. And what you have to do, you have to take observation after you do the fitting. You have to take the observation and you have to do the theory and wherever is the worst, you take that value. And it turns out that if your number of data point is, let's say, 10, then if at the worst point, your gap is more than 0.4, worst point, doesn't matter the whole thing, what the whole thing is, the whole thing may be almost perfect. If the worst point, if it is 0.4, then you are in bad trouble. So if, if it is greater than 0.4, then it should be in a bad trouble. Again, um, that depends on how many samples you have. If you have a lot of samples, it's like taking a multiple choice where you had 50 questions. You cannot come to the professor and say that I missed 20%, 20% of this and still I'm a good student. I mean, because here you, are, you have more opportunities to be correct. And uh, here you had less opportunities to be correct. So you can, you know, I missed one. So therefore you get the idea, right? But it turns out that although I'm explaining it this way, that there's a beautiful theory by Kolmarov. He's one of the greatest uh, mathematicians of all time in some way. And he has derived all these distribution functions uh, that from which these numbers are, are derived. And the 5% number is the error of the 5% of that Kolmogorov distribution. So I'm not showing you all those. You will just need to know how to use it. So for example, again, just as an example, let's say n is 20. I have 20 data points. I fitted a line, whatever that line is. And what is the worst point? This is the worst point, right? This is the worst point. So I have taken n, so I have to go in this row. And if that black uh, thing is more than 0.29 in the gap, then you are in trouble. Now you may say that 0.29, that sounds a little arbitrary. I mean, uh, that, but it's not really because remember, this is FI, cumulative probability distribution. What is the minimum and maximum of cumulative probability distribution? Zero and one, right? So therefore, it's not like zero and 25 million. And so that therefore, so this point 0.9 is with respect to 0 and 1. So even at one point, if you are 30% off at one point, chances are that you are in trouble. That's not the distribution you want to work with. And finally, uh, finally, this is Pearson chi-square test, again another test where you take the observation, observed data is experimental data and uh, expected, expected data, which is a theory, theory point. And then correspondingly, you can calculate the chi-square and one, again, uh, Pearson de defined a function which has a corresponding table. And in this case, you can see that this number will keep rising depending on the number of samples you have. Because you're, you're not normalizing, it's just adding. So if you have 20 samples, you will have 20 numbers added on top of each other, right? So therefore, you can see this number then generally goes up, but not in proportion. The more numbers you have, generally tighter is the bound because you have 27. For two, you have five. For 27, it says that you better be the plus minus, it's better be less than 27. 0.6768. So you calculate this number. Again, this is something um, uh, that is helpful. I will just end with this one story and then, um, but maybe that story requires a little bit of time. But let me tell you very briefly. The issue was that there was one of the greatest fraud in science 
happened around around 2000 or so, where uh, a scientist who had written almost two or th uh, three nature paper almost every month, and probably billions of dollars have been spent in molecular electronics, turned out to be have fake the data completely. And it turns out I caught that simply because of the chi-square test. Because if a distribution, he had a bunch of experimental data and he plotted it, it looked like a Gaussian. The second I saw that it looks like a Gaussian, I knew this guy is cheating. Because any distribution, any sample from a Gaussian should not look like a Gaussian. Because the standard error is square root of n. And so therefore the data should be random. Yes, after the testing you can say it came from a Gaussian, no problem. But if it looks like a Gaussian on a small sample, you can immediately put it in the chi square test and say that almost with guarantee uh, that this is not going to be correct. And this is how many of the fake results that have been caught recently, I think day before yesterday, a very famous food scientist was also suspended from, is it from Cornell or from some place, uh, all because of all being caught by chi square, chi -square test. They don't know statistics very well, so if you have to cheat, no, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> you have to know how to do the statistical test and run them all by yourself. <laughs> and finally, there is a bunch of methods. I, this I want to take a minute or two next class to explain it because this is also very important. How many parameters and how to make it. That's why I'm really